Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you, not at all live, from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. Hey, well, thank you, Sean. And here, this is a long-awaited podcast that, uh, it, this is going to scratch a lot of itches for everybody, but... I want to talk about a new game I played for the first time today, Bolt Action. And with me is our best friend, John Russell from Warlord Games. John, hey what's up, man? Hey, it's good. You had a good day today. Mitch, you were having a lot of fun. I saw you laughing and smiling in the corner. I, I did. It was a good crew today. We had 15 guys. I played Ringer, so it was kind of fun. So It was. It was. So I got to tell you, this is like, and guys could read about my experience in doing this. And I'm blaming you. This is your fault yes, that I'm here. I'll take full blame. And, you know... I painted my army months ago. I read it. I came here, and I got to tell you, well, first of all, I want to thank Taran Buckley, who helped me so much out. And believe it or not, if you can't join them, recruit him, he's going to become one of our writers, and he's going to help us do a lot of stuff with Bolt Action. But and I love this game. And he won Best General today. Did he really? Yep. Mm-hmm. The Axis had four – there were seven Axis players, eight Axis players, and seven Allied players. So I played a – uh, ringer for ally, mm-hmm. and uh, there was one ally that had two wins, one loss. There was four Axis players that had three wins, so the Axis dominated the day. So, so do I need to get an Axis army? The well, you no. always want one of each. You're always going to want, and, and, and what's the, the, the fabulous thing about bolt action yeah. is you can buy a box, like the Waffen SS army box. Yeah. 1,500 points. H- how much is that? 145 bucks. Okay. And you get a Tiger tank and a Sturmgewitz. So you get two tanks in that box. Man. 1,500 points. Okay, so look, I'm already upset with you, and we're going to talk about... <laughs> SD. SD. We're going to talk about a lot of <laughs> stuff, but uh, you know, I noticed you're wearing underwear underneath your kilt. Shh. So you're not a real Scotsman. That's full wool. That's full wool, baby. And thank you for looking. Yeah. Uh, how can you not notice? You're, you're, a, you're a gorgeous <laughs> man. So... Uh, so going into this process, yes. I heard a lot of people saying, eh, this bolt action. I think it was your enthusiasm that really had me pushed over. And there's, there's a lot about the game I like. It has that list-building aspect. It's yes. historical. Yes. Um, the, community is, the, the community is awesome. Uh, in five or six years of, of doing tournaments and playing the games, I finally had, I think I had one – one bad experience two weeks ago. You told us about that. And and but in five years and all the tournaments yeah. and stuff we've done around the United States and over in the UK, and uh, we've had some dealings with some uh, some of our troops. We did some stuff for them in Korea, and uh, in the desert and stuff. Uh, one bad instance. So I mean that's a pretty good record compared to some other games we could talk about. Yeah, and and so I'm going to tell you some of the things I heard about this game. And I heard beer and pretzels. And I'm going to tell you now from experience. Yeah. Of course. Hey, we have got Steve Smith here. Yeah. Um, He's a co-author of a book me and him did. And, and we're going to talk about yes. that. And actually, he and I worked together on um, Africa Corps yeah. in Avanti, which we won't talk about. Yeah. Um, but it's, the game's not beer and pretzels. Every time a dice is pulled, you have to think. Yep. You have to think like, well, is he going to move that first? That It's dynamic. And to me, this is a great game. I, I Folks out there that like are – getting tired of other World War II games, I'm going to say come to this one, mm-hmm. try it out, do what I did, maybe you know, go and find one of your raiders at a convention and try this and tell me if it scratches the itch because mm-hmm. I really like this game. And after three games, I'm exhausted, but I want to play another game. And, and, the, and, and the buy-in is about 100 bucks, Which is cool. You get Band of Brothers is 112 bucks. You get two squads of U.S. Airborne, one squad of German Panzer Grenadiers, a half-track, the rule book, dice, the templates, markers, and a, and a busted up terrain. So I mean, yeah, that, and that's and a rule book and a rule book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, this I had a great time doing this. And you know, somebody's like, "Oh, about do you care?" I I'm the really the guy that doesn't care about winning as much as am I having a good time? Is it a good experience? So I, I'm going to give Bolt Action an A. I'm going to yeah. stay with the game. Thank you. I Thank even you. bought. I even you got a priest. Mm-hmm. Because I, yeah. I need clerical support That's as right. much as possible. That's right. well, and what's great, too, is 
is you'll hear these guys just like everybody else you know plays all those other games you hear them talking about oh i did this and this and i mean i was chasing i was going here kitty kitty with a yag panther with my piat team and he was running away from me it was hilarious i i had i was chased by Tehran's um human bomb teams oh yeah those and are it, scary and he goes oh yeah these are human bomb teams and they and i go well what are you going to tell me they they go next to something and they blow up and he stopped i go because he can't explain it any better than that <laughs> but yeah my it was chasing my cromwell away and yeah. the thing too is of all the games like tend towards tanks right this is an infantry game this is a total infantry game oh yeah yeah and it's it's a great infantry game mm -hmm. um I'm I'm actually pretty impressed. Mm -hmm. I now we need to get other folks playing this. Sure. So how do we do that? Well, go to your local store. Uh, ask to see if they can play it. If you can't find it or play it in your local store, contact me, John. Russell at WorldGames.com, and I'll put you in touch with our sales team. We have a great sales team over in Phoenix. Uh, it's run by Chris Woodward, mm -hmm. and he's got three guys under him. He's got Emilio, Emiliano, and Che Morado, and then he's got Billy. Oh, I lost the last name. It's not Preston. It's Billy. I lost his Billy Preston. Name. Yeah, that's no, not Billy Preston. It's Billy. I've Wasn't he on one name. of the Beatles albums? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. I'm, just I'm sorry, <laughs> Billy. I apologize. But those three guys handle the United States, and they are phenomenal. And they'll get you product or they'll get your stuff to it. We'll find it at the game store. Uh, Eric Fontaine on Facebook, if you look him up on mm -hmm. one of our uh, bolt action things, he's building a player network. Uh, you put in your location, your zip code, and it'll find the nearest player for you if there's one by. Which, by is, you. which is important. And, yeah. You know, that's the thing, too, that I noticed, and I was actually talking to um, Steve's wife over here. Yeah, Sylvia. Is Sylvia, that guys buy the models, yep. and your models fly off the shelves, yep. but they, how do we pull them out of their houses to come play these games? Like, well, what do we have to do? Right, and, and, and that, was, that was kind of a problem we had, funny enough, up in Colorado area. Yeah. Jay Casper's one of our best raiders up there, and he's doing, he's doing a number. And, and Ed Rossman is another one of the guys that's an apprentice up there for raiders, and he is – He's starting to find a couple of stores, and he, we're starting to pull those people out of the garages because they're starting to go into there. Uh, Genghis Khan is in February in Denver, Colorado, and we had a small amount of bolt action. But as, as my Raiders and I go around to these conventions and we start planting flags, yeah, we start people – like last year when we came out to Nova, we had five players or four players for bolt action. Yeah. This year we had 15. Signed, 20 were signed up. So – it's it's just about planting flags. Get around. Drop me an email. Give me a call. Uh, my phone number's on the websites and stuff. It's 406-579-7704. 406-579-7704. The only thing I ask is... Don't call 2 in the morning. And Thursdays from 12 noon to midnight. That's when I uh, have my family time. Otherwise, on Thursdays? Yeah, on Thursdays. Otherwise, we, we do a movie night kind of thing. Uh, one of the kids or I... or my. What was the last wife, movie you saw? The last one we watched was... Last Starfighter. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we pulled it out of the shelf. It's a DVD. I went and found it. Wow. And, and we watched Last Starfighter for our movie night. The kid, One of the kids, or whoever's night it is, will pick the food. Uh -huh. For example, one night I picked uh, Achilles Heroes when we did MREs. Really? So yeah. it's themed with the food? Yeah. And it all started It all started with we started doing Thursday nights, and the kids wanted to – my, my wife is a huge Clint Eastwood fan, right? Spaghetti Western. So it was spaghetti night, and we'd watch Spaghetti Western. So we went through all of that. And then we did uh, the, uh, the Magnificent Seven. And the kids go, well, this is great. And I said, well, you know, it comes from another movie. So I dug out a VHS tape. Seven Samurai. And we watched Seven Samurai. In Japanese? Yeah. You know what's great to see that movie is get a little drunk, and yeah. I do all the voices yeah. from the movie. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a fun movie. Yeah. So, but hey, gamers have to spend time at home. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and that's what we ended up doing was and it became the movie night. So it rotates through, you know, my, my wife, my two daughters, uh, Lily and Chloe, and then myself. And it just kind of rotates through that. And they pick – the movie, and they pick the food. Usually we try to stay like we watch uh, Chinese, you know, the panda. Yeah. We'll watch, eat Chinese food, you know, or something. So it's kind of like that. But so every Thursday I want to hit your Facebook page, and I want to see what movie you're watching sure. and stuff sure. like that. That'd be great. Yeah. So I'm, And let's go back to gaming. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it, let's let's get 25 people here next year to sure. show. Sure. I, 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 I think largest, we can do it. Uh, Eric Fontaine loves challenges, and Eric's now challenged with his Mo History thing in, in Missouri. And ClawCon's coming up yeah. uh, in, in St. Roberts. But he wants to beat the, the, the largest game a demo, a, a tournament that I know of that I've attended was Cambridge Too Far in March in Cambridge, UK, this yeah. year. They had 78 players. How do we beat that record? Uh, we promote it. We get good pri We always have great prizes. We get more people. And uh, we're looking at trying to – I think Mo History is what he's trying to do. I think Eric's trying to beat that record. You know, massage tables – 
yeah. Hooters yeah. to come in yeah, and, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and booze. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's, you know, let's talk about the social aspect. I got to be honest. I think the, the comments I've gotten off the articles yeah. and the comments. Great like articles, on, too. You wrote a great article. Thing. I appreciate mean, it. Even and the guys in the UK loved it. It was great. Uh, Troy, our yeah. editor, is great. And Troy is just like me. We're both getting into this game, and it's, mm. you know, we're both saying to each other, geez, you know, how did this game pass us by? It really scratches that World War II itch. Oh, God, yes. And I, it's, I just can't say enough good things about it. I know a lot of guys are going to say, yeah, but this is wrong, that's wrong. And I was just talking with two friends of mine as we get upstairs, and we talk about two hardcore gamers. And I'll throw Sean under the bus because he's not here. And you know he's going to edit this. And, you know, gamers look for the perfect game. And I got to tell you, just like a perfect life, yeah, there's, yeah. there's no such thing. No, nope. you come close. Yeah, you play it for what's fun. Mm -hmm. You play it because you enjoy it. There's no such perfect game. Everything's going to have its falls and downfall. Mm -hmm. It's well, all good. It, and and the, the best examples of that, I think, Mitch, is uh, Blood Red Skies. Blood Red Skies. Or Check Your Six. Yeah. Both are phenomenal airplane games. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how far down that rabbit hole do you want to go? Right. Blood Red Skies is designed by Andy Chambers to be have 12 airplanes played in 45 minutes. Boom, simple. Yeah. If you want to get in the details and what's your angle and, and what's your speed. Join I mean, the Air Force. Join the Air Force <laughs> or play Check Your Six. But yeah. I mean, because Check Your Six is a phenomenal game. It is. But you won't play 12 airplanes in 45 minutes. No, I played, it was like a jet thing and it, it's hours. And I got to be honest with you, I still don't know what happened. Mm-hmm. But and you were sitting last night watching us play Blood, Blood Red Skies, and you were seeing the Immelmans, and the guy sitting around you didn't hit, but me and you were looking at each other. That's an Immelman. That's a split ass. Yeah, yeah, you knew exactly what was going on, and it was just so simple. I even blew up my Blood Red, Sky, Blood Red Skies today because yeah. it's, a, it's a good game. Now, is that more beer and pretzel? Yes, mm -hmm. it is. But guess what? We need that every once in a while. But and it also scratches that itch for the World War II guys because we yeah. have done it. You integrate it into your bolt action game. So what you do is you have, like we did at World of GamesCon this year in, in May, we had four tables going on. We were playing Guadalcanal. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and I'll mention two things during this broadcast in the next 10 minutes that we may or may not be able to talk about more when I start talking about these four tables. We like our spoilers Okay. at No Dice, No Glory. Okay. So we had the Guadalcanal, bolt action table, Japanese and Marines fighting it out. The table next to that we had Blood Red Skies. We had three Betty bombers that we had got from this other company. We're going to work on them and maybe get them into our system. Mm -hmm. And the guys over in the UK three weeks before, two weeks before, had done salute. And for salute, they set up the attack on the USS Hornet at Guadalcanal. And what had happened is they found a 1-200 scale model of the Hornet. It's four feet long, Mitch. Uh -huh. And they, they painted this thing, put it on the table. I went at my house. Yeah. And they had they had... Wildcats taken off of the deck with Joe Foss leading the way, and they, you know, Cactus Air Force. Yeah. And they had they had uh, torpedo bombers and uh, Zeros escorting them in. Well, they sent those exact models over to us for our event, so the guys were playing with ships, uh, airplanes that haven't been released yet, and and these Betty bombers were trying to get across the table. If the Betty bombers got across the table, then the Japanese on the bolt action table would have gotten a free bombardment. Nice. So it ties that in. Now on the table next to that, uh, and this is the first spoiler, spoiler <laughs> we had a, uh, we set up a Cruel Seas game. And Cruel, Cruel Seas. Seas. Cruel Seas. Is, Cruel is, Seas. Is, it, it, Cruel Seas is uh, one of John's loves. He loves the naval uh, battles and he loves this, but this is that knife fighting in the dark stuff. This is all the small boater, motorboat actions. The the uh, USS Cherry the, the chariot raid uh, the uh, the US Campbelltown on the Saint Nazaire raid. Mm -hmm. We've got PT boats. We've got S boats. We've got Schnell boat. You know the German Schnell boats. Yeah, yeah. We've got the Russian Bonhrada going up the the Volga, shooting Katyushkas. We've got Italians. We've got British. We've got Germans. All kinds of crazy boats. But in this instance, for this game, we had some Japanese uh, troop ships coming down the slot trying to reinforce. And PT boats attacked him. If the Japanese would have gotten through, the Japanese on the bolt action table would have got reinforcements. And then the fourth table, spoiler, is something that we're working on. Uh, Steve and, and a lot of the guys, we've got a couple guys out there in, in the radio land working for us. It's called Raiders. Uh-oh. And basically what it is, is we all know the bolt action plays one dice for 
the squad. Well, this is every guy in the squad gets a dice. Yeah, you were you so mentioned that skirmish. yesterday. Yeah, and we, and we and we had on this instant a Japanese village with some Japanese in it, and some Marine scouts were going through, and if they neutralized and got through this Japanese village, then on the bolt action table, the Marines got two squads of Marines to flank the Japanese, which did happen. So here's three games all interlinked, and it's not the first time we've done this. There's another game company we could talk about that did this a long time ago, and they're now starting to do it again. But Bolt Action and Blood Red Skies can tie in. And the second wave of stuff coming out, you know, we're working on uh, the bombers just came out, and there's the JU-52 in there. So Are you guys going to put out a package where if I want to host a tournament that has all three levels, I could do that? We could do that. Okay. Yeah. Or they should contact you and how you contact did it. Contact me. That's my, bo- that's my job, yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, the JU-52 is now in the bomber. So now the first thing I see when I see those JU-52 is you get three aircraft in that box for 32 bucks, And they're nice. There's Veta, a Russian 1-200 scale. Yeah, they make good stuff. And uh, there's JU-52. So first thing that jumped to my mind was Crete. But, you know, okay. Yeah. But still, same idea applies. You're playing a German-American game, and if those JU-52s get through, then false shoemakers come from the sky and the Germans get reinforcements. So there's no reason why. And they're starting to work on the Ju-87, the old Stukas coming out. Yeah. So we might start having some more anti-aircraft batteries. We might have. So there's a lot of goodness coming now from Warlord over the next few months. Yeah. yeah. So I got to look through the Cruel Seas. Yes, you did. Yesterday, I looked through the thing, and unfortunately, there's no pictures in there, and yeah. I read better with pictures. Yeah. And that Richard Rogers oh, yeah. victory at sea music kept coming into yeah. my head. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, dun 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 dun. But it's it looks like it's another. It looks like it has a l- little bit under the chrome as far, a little oh, bit yeah. more than Blood Red Skies. Yeah, yeah, and we've got uh, resin cast torpedoes. and Really? And, oh, yeah, it's beautiful. I played it in March, and it was phenomenal. When are we seeing that? When, am I, when can I get <laughs> my hands months. on that? Two, three months. And you'll, so when does the pre-order kick out? Uh, I'd say two, three months. Uh, uh, look late in the fall, maybe around Christmas time. All right. And yeah, we'll if everything goes right. And we're going to cover it. Of course we will. Because that's something that I bothered John about. It's like, hey, you know, we, we, you know, we, we want to cover like, some of this stuff. Just like black powder. Yeah, black powder. So we're going to talk about that, too. We have a lot to talk about. Um, what are the first two factions that are coming out of Cruel Seas, U.S. Japanese? First five. First, oh, wait, five? <laughs> oh. Yeah, the, the, uh, the plan is, and of course it might change, but uh, I know that we're going to have a German fleet. Okay. British fleet. Yeah. American fleet. Japanese fleet. Yep, and Italians. And Italians. That's not bad. Or Russians. Are you going to have the, the uh, uh, Decima X guys with the... I don't uh, know how far down we're, g- we're going to go some of those rabbit holes. Yeah. But but I know that... Uh, and and what's really kind of cool is we may... R- I mean, we're still working on the, the final boxes and stuff, so you know I'll probably get yelled at. But um, w- we, we like to provide stuff so you can play right away. So there'll be some cutouts of some things you can play with, like trawlers and sunk trawlers and, oh. and, and, the, and the ships and... and you know, one of the scenarios will be trying to get the spy off the shore. One of the scenarios might be trying to get the, the supply ship out, so, but the S-boats attack it, you know. So there's a lot of – you saw a lot of the scenarios in the back end. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I thought it was pretty. I didn't know there was going to be five. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And, and it works just a lot like bolt action. You, you put uh, – your nationality chits in a bag. So yeah, I saw the thing yeah. with the chits. Yeah. So it's it's an impulse-driven yep. game, yep. which is kind of neat, and it, it's it's almost like how you guys do almost all your games. Yeah, but you have to be careful because if you don't move right, you'll crash your boats together, which I did. So is that bad? <laughs> yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I heard it's bad. Yeah, and torpedoes are really bad. So we so let's talk about all the other goodies that are coming out. So black powder. Yeah. I got my order in four minutes yep. after. So Rick, Perfect. please say love you, Mitch, yep. on your thing. Yep. Um, and then we've also got uh, the desert, uh, bolt action deserts coming out next weekend. Yeah, and I think people can pre-order that now. Yep, yep, pre-order it now. Um, uh, it's it's really really uh, it's jam packed. It's over 150 pages of just unbelievable stuff. And there's a lot of new armies in there. Some retooled stuff. Uh, the Italian players will be happy. The free French players will be happy. Really? Oh yeah. And uh, even even the uh, Germans and the British have some things to be happy about. Uh, there's a lot of scenarios. Uh, it's very, very nice, and there's a lot of, lot of, lot of stuff coming up for that. Maybe my then, second army will be Africa Corps. Yeah, and there's plastic DAC and and uh, uh, Eighth Army. So and I, you have that on your site now, I believe. Yes, yes. Because I went to your site yesterday. Because I'm going to transition once again before we get to more. I'm going to pull more goodies out of you. Like black powder. Like black powder. Okay, oh, <laughs> that's a tease. I know it's a tease. <laughs> um, let's talk about what we played yesterday. Yeah. 
So, SD? Huh? SD? Strontium dogs. <laughs> so, so I'm here, and, you know, he's – John's calling me Nick, which I guess is that my new funny, name. Yeah. Yeah, it's and it's so a long day, sorry. It, no, and they were playing Blood Red Skies, and then um, oh, what's his name? The guy, the Canadian guy. Oh, uh, Dion. Dion came Dion. in. He goes, I want to see this game, and I go over and tell me about that game. Strontium Dog comes from 2000 AD, and this is a comic book that started in the late 70s, early 80s in the UK, and it just spread like wildfire. It's still going strong. It's uh, generated Rogue Trooper. It's generated Slain, uh, Torquemada, ABC Warriors, Strontium Dog, and then the one that a lot of people in America know is Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd. Right. Uh, and we were very, very fortunate a while ago. Paul Sawyer scored a coup with the Warlord guys, and we got the rights to 2000 AD and Rebellion. So what that allowed us to do is we were able to really get access to everything. And we really went whole hog. Paul did a great job. We got two guys out of the, uh, you might know these guys, uh, Andy Chambers and Gav Thorpe. Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, I have maybe <laughs> heard of them. And uh, we got those guys to do the rules for us. And we also got the blessing by the authors and the artists of this strip. And uh, the, it's an 80-plus page rule book, 90-page rule book. Every page almost has something colorful on it. Or a comic strip, I, I I hate to say, or I, I it's sexy. It is sexy, a, a, and it, it's got uh, even cartoon pictures of our miniatures in there with the little cartoon bubbles and stuff. So I'm going to tell you what I did. Well, first of all, everybody knows that I'm weak. I'm a weak man, mm -hmm. and I bought this game because it's really yes. good. But I went home last night and I couldn't fall asleep, so I picked up a Kindle version of one of the SD case files. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Case yeah. file one. Uh, I got actually I ordered Case Fall One paperback because I wanted to yeah, get you that. Yeah, gotta have that one. But I was reading; it was like the early years yeah. or something yeah, with the two the characters. Wars, yeah. And yeah. you know, so as the people know, I'm not into the ahistorical stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was watching you play this game uh, with Dion, and it's it's a tight skirmish game. Yeah. It's fun. It comes with terrain. Yeah. Sixty bucks, you get everything you yeah. need to play. And, and if you really want to get a taste, if you've never heard of Strontium Dog, go out on YouTube. And put in Strontium Dog, and you're gonna see. There's a there's a 20 minute fan film. Yeah. That they did a couple years ago, and it, it really nails Johnny and Wolf, and it, and it gets you the feel of what it's 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 bounty hunting in space, all right? Right. And in this box, you get eight metal miniatures. You get that the the uh, wind generator. Yeah. Uh, you get four solar panels, a watchtower, and and a hut. Yeah. Plus all the markers, for sixty bucks. I was <laughs> I was shocked. I thought like. <laughs> I thought you were, and okay, I'll be honest with you, I thought it was like, is, is that the price, you know, is that the con price? And I went on your website, no, nope. it's, it's, it's 60 the, bucks. It's 60 bucks, and yeah. you get so much, and it's like, you don't need the extra packs that come nope. with it. Nope. But I picked them up anyway, because yep. I'm a weak man. Yeah. Yeah. But this is a tight game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, you know, and also, when you were talking Johnny yesterday, yeah. I thought you were talking about yourself. No, no, Johnny Alpha. Yeah, because he's yeah. like, oh, Johnny's going to do this, and I'm like... <laughs> George is getting upset. Yeah. And I was like, really, I was like, uh, I thought he was talking about himself, but this is a, this is a fun game. Yeah. And it's, it's got the same, that, 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 uh, impulse. Yeah. Pick, you, you put ch uh, star chits in the bag. Yeah. But some of the star chits, depending upon the cool rating, which I thought was cool, of, 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 yeah, <laughs> it's uh, of, cool. of the players, uh, they can, once they've done, when you pull their chit out, you, they do one, or two, one double action or two single actions. And then if the guy's got a high enough cool rating, like uh, Max Bubba's got a four, but mm -hmm. Johnny's got a five, Johnny will roll five of our special uh, uh, 2000 AD dice. And if the special marker comes up that says 2000 AD, yeah. that chit can go back in the bag and he can do it all over again. So yeah, that was a really interesting mechanic it, yesterday. It makes him a super character in the, in the comic book. Yeah, and yeah. It, it was like you guys were sneaking up. I, I yeah, go check this game out. I just I think it's a really good game. I mean, I bought it because, once again, not my genre, but totally a tight game. And yes, spoiler. Uh, this is a the game mechanics for this game are going to go on to other games in the 2000 AD style genre, like Judge Dredd for the U.S. audience. Yeah, or ABC Warrior, or it, it's kind of. I mean, Steve Jackson did a great job when he did GURPS. 
You know, mm-hmm. if you had that central score, and yep. you had all those tack-ons. Kind of like the same thing. Uh, the same basic building blocks and the same style and how things go for Strontium Dog will be applied to possibly ABC Warrior, one of Paul's favorites. Yeah. Uh, it's Rogue Trooper. It's, it, it's a really good game. Yeah. I, I'm looking at it now, and it's, it's visually, the models look great. Like, for 60 bucks, man, like, wow. I mean, the, the book alone... Oh, to yeah. me, it's something yeah. like you would normally pay 30 40, 40 yeah, yeah. And then the models, the models look excellent. I mean, it's it looks like it's a really good game. Mm-hmm. It, it It is, It's but you get so much in this $60 pack. And once those are sold out, folks, yeah. you're probably not going to get another. Yeah. yeah, it's already sold out once. Oh, really? Yeah, we, within the, within a week or so, it sold out. We, we, this is our second run already. Wow. Yeah, and, and we had two, uh, two, three weeks ago, we were at uh, Maneuvers yeah. in Tulsa. And uh, we had this guy walk up and said, what is this? I said, well, it's Strontium Dog. Well, what the hell is that? So we'll sit down and let me play. And he, we got done, and he had this shit-eating grin. And he got up and he ran over. And the next day, he drug his wife over the table. And his wife said, you got to play this game. And his wife kicked his ass. And they were laughing at the end of the game. So we got to buy this. And so they were going, they'd never seen it before, never heard it before. But it, 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 there's something about it. Maybe it's mutations. But it, it's something it, it, and it's that's something about it. It's mm-hmm. like that kind of weird. Yeah. And it's not like like, OK, and I'll just use like a game like Malifaux. Yeah. yeah it's kind of interesting uh, as a great mechanic, mm-hmm. but it's it's not an easy game to play this. How you explained it to him and it was over with quickly. Yeah. And you play scenarios. I I think this is a great game. Well, and, and it's also very player interactive. You can when you start the game and you're and once you get the idea how it plays, which is really fast, then you go into the scenarios and you can design your hitman or your, your bounty hunters you can design your weapons you you're, you're allowed to depending upon how do, well you do on the bounties you can start modifying your basic hand blaster or your long guns or your blazookas and turn them into uh these weapons you want and we have a section here called build a mutie so and we have a box of a i bunch saw of parts. that yesterday yeah, <laughs> yeah so you can build five of your own mutants whatever you want yeah and then the scenarios, you generate who's a protagonist. You go down through, and there's different scenarios. And then you can go into the campaign and carry grudges. It's really a, a story-driven uh, narrative game system. Yeah. Uh, folks, I'm going to do a write-up on it. Please check it out. I don't know when I'm going to get my stuff painted. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely going to be something that I think folks should check out. If you go watch that YouTube thing, Strontium Dog and it, it's, uh, Search and Destroy, it's only 20 minutes long. That's it. And 20 minutes. You're going to go, holy shit, that was awesome. Maybe you should watch that for movie night. Yeah. Well, it's, the, my kids have all watched it. Oh. Uh, yeah, we already did it. Now they're playing Strontium what food, Dog. What food would you eat with that? Uh, oh, good question. Maybe tacos? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Taco good. Tuesday. Taco, yeah. But uh, it, it's really good. And you can see some of the techniques. Uh, Johnny loves his time bombs. And it's Johnny just, loves it. You see, when you were saying that, I thought <laughs> you were talking about yourself, <laughs> which is okay, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Mitch loves his, you know, yeah. and well, and, and well, and like you, you were reading the rule book yesterday, and, and, and the funny stuff that they put in that yeah. rule book it's about very you know, pithy, yeah, you, yeah, very pithy. Using uh, the inch, yeah, yeah. the inch used yeah. by carpenters yeah. and yeah. people in North America. Yeah, yeah, it just Andy and Gav had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. and it, and they actually interviewed him. Uh, we have a, if you guys don't know, we have a warlord uh, YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, I know you do. And, and there's a couple, there's a couple uh, interviews, and there's one out there with. Uh, Gavin, Andy, and it's it's a great one. Well, let's talk spoilers. Okay. So um, I'm going to tell you something I recently watched. Okay. Um, on Hulu, I decided okay. because I had some painting to do. Yes. That I was going to watch all the MASH episodes. Uh-oh. All 11 seasons. And maybe we should call Steve over for this. Oh, Steve. Yeah. Steve. And um, so... Uh, over. We've got some spoilers to talk about. So either know I'm of the age where I remember them all and... I remember when they were coming out. I remember them all in syndication. Right. I watched all 11 seasons. I just finished this past week, and uh, I realized I did not see every MASH. There was like he two or three. talking about MASH. You know it's coming. <laughs> so, and, you know, my, everything's related with me, you know. So they are, so then I'm reading um, the book about, um, oh, I forgot the guy, Halberstram's book yeah. on Korea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is an amazing book. That guy can that that cat can write. So and wh- he was famous for baseball. Oh, Halverson. Wasn't yeah. he the candy bomber? 
No, that's Gail Halverson. Oh, sorry. Uh, I forgot the guy's name. I probably got it wrong, but it's that thick book yeah, on, oh, yeah. on Korea. Korea. It's a big white book. Korea. Korea. Yeah. So then, so I yeah. watched the thing on Korea, <laughs> and now I'm reading a book on Korea. So I'm going to want to game Korea one day. Really? Is, is there anything you can talk to me about that? Well, I, I think if you really want to get jazzed up, you should. Uh, there's there's a book out there uh, that one of the guys that helped uh, that. On the project that we were on, uh, we actually got some author uh, to help us out a little bit. And there's a, a movie out there called The Brotherhood of War. Yes. Uh, I, I know I slaughtered that. and but um, yeah, I don't think you said that yeah, right. Uh, that is uh, a crazy-ass movie. Yeah. And But yeah, it, it's from the Korean perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and when we were approached to do this project that we're talking about, me and Steve at the very beginning sat down and we said, we can't, and Paul Sawyer was, was involved, we can't write this book from the U.S. or the U.N. perspective. It has to be from a neutral Korean perspective. Perspective, and and uh, uh, the task task was thank you. Uh, the task was uh, monumental. Uh, it was uh, it it was some best of times, some worst of times. There we was still haven't gotten to the spoiler here. I, I know it's. They're trying to talk uh, quietly here, so I'll give it to you as, uh, you know. Apparently, it's already out on Amazon. People are pre-ordering it already. Are they really? I shit you not. So I, let me introduce I, I, I you guys. I, I, let me introduce you guys to Steve Smith. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, you're going to have to give a hand on the mic. Yeah. Um, Stay, Steve. Okay. Hi. Hi, Mitch. How are a you? And Steve and I, it's funny. We know each other. We worked on a, a yes. previous work, too. Yes. And um, About World War Two. About World War Two. Yes. Sir. But uh, is there a career project? Go ahead, John. Well, <laughs> he doesn't um, look happy. <laughs> well, it's it's been the cat is out of the bag. The Pandora's box has been opened. You know, you, you told us about it in January, by we the way. It, we told, I told you guys about it in January. Yeah. Paul Sawyer talked about it on his second broadcast, on his second podcast. Oh, did he? Yeah, he did. Oh, he let the cat out. Of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, and we've talked about it. I've been wanting to do this project for about three years. I've been talking with Steve about but, it for. But why did you want to do this? It's. Korea is so close to bolt action. Korea is it, nobody has done it in twenty eight, right? No, nobody's done it in fifteen. Nobody has done Korea. Nobody has done Korea. Nobody's done Korea, and and there's and and when me and Steve started researching this, every day we'd be talking, or every other day, oh my God, I found this. We got to write about this. We got to write about this. It's it, it was only a three year conflict, mm -hmm. but. We could still be writing about it if it, we, we could have kept writing about it to this day, but we we had to stop, and it, it was just so much that we wanted to get in there, and it was and and we really really wanted to get more than just the UN perspective. We got to get the Chinese perspective. We got to get the kind. Steve did massive amounts of research on seeing. So when we started writing this, we all thought, okay, Korea is 1950 to 53. We all know the armistice hasn't been signed until possibly maybe soon, so the battle never really finished. And there was incidences on the border. Yeah. But then when we started thinking about when did the Korean War start, was it June 1950? June 27th, 1950. Yeah. yeah. But really? No, it wasn't because I'm reading that book. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't. They had border skirmishes for well oh, and, for years. And, and you know, Mitch, I'll, I'll tell you that if you really examine the Korean conflict about – how that thing got started and when it really got started and you know that is a war that should never have occurred right it was a war by accident um you know when you go back to the potsdam conference and the three superpowers at that time um the united states russia and, and actually great britain they all agreed that something should have you know something needs to be done about um uh, korea and the independence of korea but at that time nobody decided what form of government Korea should have had. Now, fast forward uh, a little bit of time. An agreement was made uh, just to use the 38th parallel as a matter of convenience. Because for two guys got in a Jeep and yeah. drove around and said, hey, let's just two, two American guys get to right. take this out. And so it was only used as a, as a line for disarmament for the Imperial Japanese Army, and that was it. And then we get into a bunch of geopolitics. Um, 
but it was simply a war that should never have been had. But if you go back a little bit further in time, because of the Japanese occupation and then um, being a, a Chinese protectorate, the, the Korean people had never really exercised a form of independence of their own, so they did not know how Some to. Some of them still govern. haven't. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and, and the thing is, the thing is too, is um, when the Japanese took over Korea, if you've ever been over there, some service guys been over there, they had the, 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 the palace, the Korean palace. Yeah. Well, the Japanese government, and there was, there was a, a stream that flowed out from the, 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 the palace, to the, and they would say, well, that's how the, the power flows from the palace to the people. Yeah. Well, when the Japanese came and occupied it, they built their, their uh, uh, governmental buildings st- astride that stream. So the flow of power then... Uh, and for those who don't know, the Koreans are not big fans of the Japanese. No. no. Uh, so that water flowed from the palace to the Japanese governmental building and then out to the people. That's how deep stuff went. So th- I I think the history of Korea is totally fascinating, but let's let's look at like gamers. Okay. Why as a gamer, why why would I be interested in in, pl- in playing Korea and what would be different to, about it than a Vietnam game or a World War 2 game? All That's right. my one good question I asked. Here we go. Podcast. So to use John's term spoiler. So Paul Sawyer says, okay, let's do a book. So we wrote Bolt Action Korea. It started out as a good idea for a supplement. They wanted, they being Warlord Games, wanted a a single book, all three years of the war, both sides, in one supplement. Sounds like a pretty simple, straightforward. Well, if the book is eight inches thick. No, we were limited To to a certain amount of words. And initially that sounded like a good idea. But then it became a little tougher, and so we had to, and I'm, straight up, I'll tell every gamer out there, yes, we had to leave out a great deal of information. Now, to get down to the nuts and bolts of gaming, we brought forward a great deal of the elements of World War II, but your World War II armies, um, you can use a lot of the figures, so mm-hmm. you get a two-for-one deal here. Or three-for-one if you do K-47. Three-for-one if you do K-47. However, Bolt Action Korea is a different game. Really? It's a standalone game. In Bolt Action Korea, grenades are a weapon. Really? Yes. In Bolt Action Korea, you have jets. In Bolt Action Korea, you have uh, helicopters. helicopters. You have a stronger use of recoilless uh, weapons. You have a better save with your medics because there are mass units. Right. And... The reduction. You've got to do a Hawkeye well, it, special see, figure. See how far, and we had that discussion. And yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We had that discussion. But, you know, and, uh, let's put Klinger on the front of the book and call it Clanker. And then we came the figure give out. And then it's yeah. like, well, then, but then me and Steve said that doesn't really honor or justify what that war was about. It doesn't. So, it, 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 and I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk down about MASH and I don't want to talk about those guys. But it doesn't give the reflection of the historical significance of this conflict. And it, it, I don't want to say tarnish because it was a phenomenal series and I love MASH. And it does give that other element. Yeah. And we wanted to have some kind of element in that. But it, 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 in an instant, it changes the Korean book that we wanted to write into, oh, it's a lark right. instead of a serious war game. Yeah, Not even Colonel Flag will make right. the book, there's right? A, there's a... Back in 1950, uh, a reporter, and I've been researching this to find out who was the name of that reporter, asked the question to President Truman, is this considered to be a police action? And he said yes. And that question has haunted Korean veterans ever since. Yeah. Because President Truman did not formally declare war. But back to the game. Um, Another element in this game is you have a new, we'll call it a special character, where you have a veteran NCO in your headquarters who Sam Elliott from We Were Soldiers Once is, oh. is, is a good example of, of that veteran, old, grizzled, grizzled d- tough platoon sergeant um, who can um, give a bonus to the platoon leader or the company commander when he's nearby uh, for morale. If the pl- if you lose your your officer, he can take over the platoon because in Korea that's what happened. Korea yeah. was a pl- yeah Korea was a was a platoon sized battle. It was a company sized battle. Korea, because of the terrain, was not large formations. 
even though there were large formations. And terrain was horrible. 70 per, yeah, 70 percent of Korea is mountainous terrain. Right. Yeah. So um, you have a lot of small unit actions, and that's what Korea was about. Korea was a fast-moving uh, battlefield where you had platoons engaging. There was a lot of night fighting that went on. Um, the theory of the Chinese horde, um, I've, I've torn that apart. That did not occur. No, the Chinese were masters at night infiltration, yeah. camouflage, deception. Um, and they were all veterans because they just finished fighting their civil war. Correct. So and the, they were all volunteers. Yes, they were true volunteers. The Chinese soldiers did not get paid really? while they were in Korea. No. Wow. They were true volunteers. And there's one thing that podcasts can't do, and it's looking at these two guys and the seriousness of this pro and I'm not I'm not kidding around because look, you know, these are historical games and there's a lot of stuff in some games that are just not like a little fantastic. But it seems like the passion that you guys put into this project is you know, like with all the research that you guys have done. Steve spent hours and hours and nights and nights just digging through stuff. We found uh, uh, declassified debriefs of Chinese and North Korean soldiers on, on the line. We found some beautiful maps of, and it's the old, see, we also, like in Blood Red Skies, you've got that background kind of 50s, 40s feel. Yeah. Which we try to do that as well. So some of the maps are maps from declassified. I'll send them to you. I'll okay. Send you, I'll send you the maps that I found from the, from the 1951 and 52 um, military intelligence sections from 9th Corps. Uh, the maps that they used, and, and we used a yeah. lot of that. And, uh, you know, so you and I have worked on games before, yeah. and uh, uh, let's not mention the company, but th they didn't put this much research <laughs> into. No, oh my God. no. but uh, keep in mind, Mitch, I'm a veteran. Yeah. So you know, I, I think we all are here yeah, in that's this the room. approach that I took, you know, that that's why we didn't do the Klinger thing, because, you know, the, the Korean veterans have already been uh, dismissed enough. Mm -hmm. Finally getting some recognition. Yeah. 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 And so when I took a look at the, the, honestly, the savagery of the battles, and, you know, we mentioned the, the movie yeah. The Brotherhood of War, uh, that really captures it. And that's something else, too. The, the North Koreans and the South Korean soldiers, when if, if there's a, a, a bolt-action fight, you know, on, on a table right. during a tournament or dur during a game, if there's two armies that are going to meet, uh, there's going to be some extra dice rolling because there's going to be a little extra hand-to-hand -hand, because it's going to get a lot more brutal on a tabletop, uh, extended hand-to-hand. -hand. Yeah. We took a lot of that, those elements, because you were mentioning earlier in your broadcast about the perfect game. This is interesting. We can't do that. Right. It's, it's a game. If they want a perfect game, go play Napoleonics. Uh, because uh, That's another fight yeah, we're not going to get Black into. powder. Black powder. There you go. Because we can't <laughs> do that. We are socializing. We are playing a game with our friends. Mm -hmm. And we are doing our best to represent a period of time um, as, as grown men pushing toys across the board. That's it. Uh, if you want a perfect game, go write your own rules. That's how I feel. So when, there you I, go. when I hear somebody, you know, in the hallway going, well, I don't like those rules, I politely ask them, well, have you written your own? Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, you know, and I encourage them to do it. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, with, with – like Bolt Action Korea, yeah, I put a lot of passion into it because I was trying to honor, you know, the the 89-year-old um, Korean veteran who lives down the street from me who, mm -hmm. to this day, he was at Chosin, and he flies his Marine Corps flag every day. Every day. Yeah, and I just watched that documentary, and it's about that whole retreat. And, you know, it's one thing to read about it than to watch these right. things. But it's interesting, and I got to tell you, like you guys putting that as a homage to them in a game, I think is awesome. There's, yeah, there and was. Go ahead, please finish. No, and our players out there who love the historical aspect of these games, really, I think will appreciate something like that. I, ho well, I, I hope they do. Yeah, and uh, there was a book out there called "Hold Back the Night," uh, and then there was a movie with Chuck Connor, the old rifleman, yeah. called "Hold Back the Night." And it's about a little squad platoon running through that stuff and getting chased all the way. So we want to put that on it. Now, we can't call it Hold Back Tonight. We, I can't call it, you know, we had to change some of the names to protect to, to, to protect the IPs and stuff like that. But, yeah. we, but we wanted to get that feel into the game. So we tried to include some of that. And and uh, and then during the research, you know, Steve kept on finding stuff like crazy. How do we put this in? How do we put this in? And then we did a lot of box outs 
uh, with, and that's when we found some crazy stories. Um, I, you know, we, we could spend the next hour talking about some of the stuff we well, found. Well, I'll tell you what, and I'm going to ask, when, when are we going to start seeing this come out? Probably next year. Uh, it, it, Amazon and its infinite wisdom from Osprey's already put it on there for pre-orders, and guys are pre-ordering. I, it's it's I, already, uh, and I'll just tell you the truth because I do my research. It's already on the Osprey site. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's already on there. And it's yes, yeah, Steve did mention it to me. Yeah. I think by accident, but you mentioned it, and it's on the Osprey site. Yeah. So what I like to do is, as we get closer to that coming oh, yeah, out, yeah. is to and, sit and, down and, and, and talk and, and, for and four and hours. And we're allowed, and we're allowed to talk more. Uh, I'll just mention this because this is this is open source. Um, some of the things we found were crazy. Some of the things were just, I couldn't believe it. And, and What's and the, can I ask, and if you guys can't answer, say no. Mm -hmm. What's the craziest thing that made it? What's the craziest thing that didn't make it in the The craziest game? thing I think that made it was uh, Private Speakman. That I didn't even know about this guy. I didn't, I know, who's yeah, Private pri Speakman? Private Speakman, and I'm hope I'm, I think it's Private Speakman. And I'm, he, uh, he's, a, he's a British guy. And uh, in the f uh, during one of the battles, the Chinese came up. Was the he hill. in the Gloucesters? Uh, no, I don't. Black watch. Black, he's Black, Black watch because the Black Gloucesters watch. almost got well, annihilated. And th that's in there, Steve. We, we, we try to put some of that in there. Um, this guy Speakman uh, was holding the line, and the Chinese were getting getting ready to overrun, and they wanted they needed time to fall back to their second second line of defense. So this guy's six six. Okay. So he stands up and he starts chucking grenades at the Chinese, and he's chucking grenades and he's chucking grenades and he's chucking grenades and he chucks so many grenades he runs out of grenades. So he grabs the next thing he finds in the, in, in the trench, empty beer bottles. Really? I shit you not, empty beer bottles. And he starts chunking empty beer bottles at these Chinese guys. I would run from that. <laughs> and he's chucking six foot six American uh, British guy, a Yankee Devil. So he's know. he's in the game. There's a there's a box out story about him. And, and he ends up surviving and, and getting back, and, and he holds him off long enough. And, in fact, he survives the war. Did he win the Victoria Cross? Yes, he did. And okay. what's special about that is he lived. <laughs> he lived. He got the Victoria Cross. He was the last uh, Victoria Cross uh, um, recipient. It was, it was given to him, or, or it, it was, it was uh, vouchered and given to him when the king was still alive. However... Mm -hmm. He received it from Queen Elizabeth, and he was the first, first Victoria Cross that Queen Elizabeth gave out. And the real big surprise, yeah, as of the writing, he's still alive. He's one of ten Victoria Cross guys still alive. Wow! In in England, he goes around does the Korean things, and that was just like holy macro. That's just we had to put that in a box out somewhere. So uh, let's just quickly talk some economics here. <coughs> I see the passion. I see the history behind it. I see the, the change in rules. Let's look at our community. Like, how do we get them into a game like this? Because we all know I have more rule books in my house yeah. than I care. And well, I, it's, I have black it's, powder. It's the, bolt, it's the bolt action rule book. You need okay. that. You've already it, got that. You can play bolt action. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a supplement. It's, it's, they're going to let – okay, the company – Wardour is going to call in a supplement, so you've already got the Bolt Action rule book, so you buy the Bolt Action Korea book because you, you need that for your basic rules. And that's the start. Yep, that's the start. <coughs> now, if you play Americans, British, whatnot, you've already got most of your figures. I mean, really, if you play um, a UN side, you, you basically already have your Bolt Action army, your Bolt Action Korea army. Um, there will be some modifications of some things that we cannot talk about. Yes. Okay. However, because there's so much, there was 24 nations that were on the UN side and about four or five on the, on the communist side, so we couldn't get them all. There'll be some PDFs. Okay. Because I tell you which I would collect, mm -hmm. and you guys are gonna, huh? Name it. Turkey. Yeah. Ah, the Turkish Brigade. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm very passionate about the Turkish Brigade. Oh, so it may be something I may I may, may see. Well, t we could talk offline. Okay. Um, Which means I can't talk about it. Yeah. Well, the thing about the Turkish Brigade is I, I can't vouch for actual models, but I might have some ideas for you. But but they were tough, and I can tell you this. They're in one of the scenarios. They are in the scenarios, and the Chinese were, were actually afraid of the Turks. Yes. They were brutal with their knives. Yeah. Well, the, and the Ep uh, Ethiopians were they were the ones that, at the end of the war, there was a prisoner exchange. Yeah. There was no, I think it was the Ethiopians didn't have any because no Ethiopians were captured. 
Really? It, they would not allow themselves to be captured. Wow. There's some crazy stories about some of the POWs. I'm, you see, I'm going to go home and finish this 500-page book tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look, when this gets closer, we're going to have you on. Sure. And let's, I'm going to do, like, a whole big thing for, for it, too, but it's – because I'm worried now I'm going to get into asking questions you guys can't answer. Well, what, what, amazed, what, what amazed me, I think, amazes Steve, is w we've been working really hard. Steve's been doing crazy stuff with this. I mean, he's been burning the night oil. Sylvia can say yes to this. My family has suffered. Over yes. This. Yeah, um, it's worth it, though. But uh, what amazed me was when I saw that, when I saw that email from uh, – I jokingly, there were some guys joking about it on website, and there's this one guy who so it's not coming out. My inside sources say that like, it's too early. can't be tell. I'm looking at Steve. We're laughing. Yeah. And then – and then we, then it comes out. It, it was on a French site, and then it disappeared. But now it's on the Osprey site. It is. And then it's another guy, Jeff Fortala, sends me an email and says, "Hey, look!" And it's already got pre-orders. I'm like, <laughs> it, it, "It's still in production. We're still trying to get it done." But it, it's, if that's the passion out there already, I think it's going to be a great one. So, let's look at hey Korea. I I think it's there. I think you guys have the passion. Let's look at what is another conflict that you guys would put into a game that you think has been neglected over the last few years or in, in general? Period. Yeah. Um, I have two ideas. Yeah. One would be what I would just call the small wars. These are the conflicts Fresh of the – what's that? Fresh fires. Fresh fires Rhodesia. The, um, the conflicts of maybe the 1950s as yeah. empires imploded. Uh, I know a guy that wrote his, mask, his Ph.D. thesis on Mozambique. Portuguese air power in the Mozambique. But you yeah. know how, how yeah. especially the British Empire, as it, as it started to Malaysia, uh, yep, you know, coalesce into, into nothing. Um, and you had all these small conflicts, Malaysia and Borneo and whatnot, um, into China coming apart. Yeah, right. The colonial powers. Oh, colonial started coming right. apart. Right. So you know, writing uh, writing a set of uh, rules for something like that um, to incorporate. You know the the night the small wars of the 1950s, um, and I've always uh, had a, a real passion. You know, John mentioned um, the uh, oh, what's the one with the skirmish? The the, the raiders. raiders. Um, I would definitely love to see uh, the raiders concept, and I've always been a fan of taking that to a to a 54 millimeter. You know, because the older I get, you know, the more I think about my childhood. Yeah. Remember the old green plastic guys? Of course. Uh, you know, and, and playing a, a you squad know, on squad. I have them in yoga poses. Nice. Yeah. But, you know, playing a squad on squad at a larger scale, um, that would be something enjoyable, um, you know, maybe with my old Airfix models. Uh, other than that, I would um, – I do have an idea for something I'm going to submit to uh, Warlord. Um, I don't know that I'll discuss it here, but – it has to do with uh, running from, you know, in, for a for a Scottish clan that'll go from, you know, about 560 to 1898. Really? It'll incorporate everything from Hail Caesar to Pike and Shot and Black Powder and all of that, but it'll follow the history of a particular Scottish So you clan. were upstairs talking to Blood and Plunder guys, and I asked, what is the new in force to play? And they said the Scottish Pirates. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm building a Scottish Pirates list. I and he's wearing a kilt already, so, yeah. you know, whatever. I can help you with some of that. Yeah. Um, other than that, I would probably say to somebody, tell me what your passion is, and I'll tell you if I can do it. Yeah. A and that's really all it is. <laughs> I mean, like, some of these games, yeah, some of them are taken from comic books. Some of them are taken for history. But, really, you still need good mechanics. Y and you, you need people that want to play it. I do have an idea for uh, uh -oh. something I've been thinking about. Ever since this writing got started, I want to call it Naughty Wars. Uh oh. But it's N O T T Y. Well, I don't know if I'd be interested. In, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know where you went when yeah, I said I that, though. Yeah. Okay. But it'd be a, it'd be a, kind of like a. T the conflict takes place in Nottingham. Really. Yeah. It's a park lot war. It features all of the game companies in Nottingham uh, a lot of them yeah and you know that they, they it's a parking lot war where they all finally coalesce and they battle this one other company in Nottingham mm -mm. you know all these initials kind of come together and one of them decides not to um, not to all hail the claw of the big company 
and uh, so using some of the comments from Dad's Army, you know. Yeah. Uh, because there's just the one corporal likes to, you know, they, they don't like the bayonet up in them. And so, you know, taking little motifs from all these little bitty companies and it doing a parking lot war and trash can lids for shields and slinging rocks at each other. That'd be, that'd be really cool. It'd be funny. Um, What's that in uh, Meaning of Life with the uh, the insurance company? There you go. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I had an idea for a game. You said Naughty Wars, and I know where you went. Yeah, and it's it's uh, clowns fighting against each yeah. other. Yeah. And, like, a, a yeah. clown car can, like, like you can get 50 clowns in those things, yeah. and each type of clown. Something like that, Car Wars, or well, what was it? Well, they had the... Uh, with clowns. Well, well, they you had need the, clowns. The, the zombie, they had the zombie clowns for uh, the, the, zomb- the, the zombie game. That they well, did. Didn't Twilight some game? company do that back in the 80s? Probably. Uh, the, Probably. The, 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 one of those Donahue companies? Yeah, we, yeah. I think... Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll talk offline about yeah. developing the uh, the clown game. Uh, well, and, and to, to caveat what Steve was saying... I, we love the passion of the Warlord guys and the Warlord gamers. And every single one of them come up when they find out about Korea, they say, when are you going to do Vietnam? Well, he, here's the thing, okay? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Do they, if they want it, they can write it and submit it. But I, I'll work on it. But, but That's tough. Yeah, here's the, here's the thing, though, is what we want to do about that. John's fa- one of his favorite sayings is, you know, history never stops. Yeah. So it's always going on. It's always happening. But if you look at it as a building block approach, We've done World War II. We're doing World War II. We'll keep doing World War II, especially some of these new stuff what we're doing. And we're also doing Korea. So next isn't Vietnam in the historical chain. It's the brush fire wars. It's the seven day, war, six day war. It's the Algeria. It, it, Algeria. It, it, it's the Yom Kippur. It's 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 and Haiti. You know, it's Dominican and Republic. I know I'm not going to bring this up, and it's we'll move on. But you know what my favorite is? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I have a ton of miniatures for yeah. it, and, and it's yeah, I'm a great war fan. Yeah, great war. I am a great war fan. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. I see yeah. yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. and so uh, I mean, yeah, well, we're, we're gonna get him some uh, Larry's and Danielle stuff. Yeah, I know. Do you want some yours or something? Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, we, we we're talking. There, about yeah, and mm-hmm. what was that? Do you have an itch that needs to be scratched? I I have an itch that needs to be scratched, and he knows about I know, it. Yeah, he <laughs> knows about it. It's yeah. like really, because you know it's. And it's just like your passion with Korea, mm-hmm. and it's like with the Great War, and especially with the Hunrith. It's I have a ton of I'm painting up early, you know, early you, war. It, I'm buying when it wasn't trenched. Well, yeah, when it wasn't trenched. Yeah, in the East Front. So Daniel and Larry Freeman will be able to take care. Of and really. I'll tell you what, I'm I'm reading. It was a hard to get book. It's called the Battle of the the Bantu, and it's about Africa. And I've read four or five books on the African like. Mimi and Tutu's big adventure and stuff like that. Like, you want to do a skirmish game? We'll talk. We'll talk, guys, because that, I think that's fun. Well, but 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 that's and, and and as much as I would love to do Vietnam next, the thing is, why make the leap when we can build it up? Korea, uh, I, I want to say it was easy. wasn't easy, but it was easy in the fact that a grand was still being used, the Ma Deuce was still being used, yeah. the burp guns, everything. The weapons are mostly the same. So we can develop the next to the brush fire and do those weapons. The M14, the M16 starting to come in, the, 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 the Kalashnikov. We can start. Why jump ahead when right. we can build up and build on it? Well, and let me add this, John. Um, one of the concerns for Korea was knowing that my, I guess my passion and my anxiety was knowing that somewhere on a game table, you know, a pair of guys, maybe a, a, a lady was going to step up to play a game. And I felt like I owed it to them. Uh, it was my, I was duty bound to make sure that I, you know, did my best to provide as much accurate information as possible on a weapon um, or a squad uh, or the number of, you know, figures that are supposed to be in that squad. And like John said, it was easier for us to transition from World War II to Korea as far as a lot of the weapons go. But, you know, trying to find the, the Chinese T-O-N-E to that figure out, it, it took us a couple of months because yeah. it turns out there was not one. Now, transitioning, say, from Korea to brush fire wars and then from brush fire to Vietnam, well, now we have to go out and we've got to go find an M-14 or the, the early war 
uh, M16, and then we got to work on this, the stats for a tabletop, converting that weapon system to a tabletop. And we got to do it right because, you know, there's a gamer out there counting on us to do that right. And if we don't get it right, then, then we've invalidated the game. So I've And, and, I've and just, j just to caveat off that, and, and we were so passionate about getting some things right. You'll understand this, Mitch, and, yeah. and, and our veterans are out there. Me and Steve both insisted that the last page of the book, the last page of the book is a blank page with the simple words in both English and Korean, mm -hmm. dot, dot, dot. To those who've served, because you know all those. Yeah, you know exactly the page yeah. I'm talking about, right? Yeah, that will be the last page in the book. To yeah. those who serve, I'll tell you what. When the game comes out, we should get a card table played by the Korean mem uh, Memorial, which is right up the street, and it's you know that's a moving memorial. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really is. Oh, God, yes. Sylvia is like, <laughs> we're <laughs> doing it. She's she's already she's she's getting the table set now. As it is. But, you know, a lot of guys don't understand that, that play these games, and they complain, and they bitch, and they say, you know, not accurate, but it's like, you know, the folks that are listening, this is the sweat equity, the mental equity that goes into making these games. And if you want to think, like, well, they got this wrong. Well, it's not for lack of research, folks. Right. And it's yeah. not for lack of passion. Yeah. You know, we're you humans. Know, you have to compromise. <laughs> huh? You, you have to compromise. You have to compromise. So many pages, so many words. Right. So, I mean, you should see these guys. And, and it's the passion that you got, and that to me is, I think that's lost on a lot of gamers. Well, my dad was there in 53 on a carrier. So he, he and, then, and then we've got, all got relatives in some form or fashion that are there or still with us. You know. and, and to be honest, it is the least talked about conflict. It's the least written about. It's the least watched. And, you know, a lot of people know it from, from MASH, which... Yeah. You wonder if it did, if it wasn't for that TV show that ran for 11 years, would people even remember it? Right. Like the War of 1812. Right. But but, and again, we could probably talk about this for a long, long time. We but, could. But we've got one of our raiders, Ed Nelson's here, and he's a big um, fan. Beyond the Gates of Antares. Yeah. So so uh, okay. So enough of me blathering. Yeah. I want to talk. I want you guys to tell me about and tell our folks about what is coming out that they should get really excited about. Okay. Thanks, so guys. Thanks, Steve. Steve, thank you. <coughs> uh, trying to push it up, see. So, I mean, we can actually take a quick break because okay. a, a lot of people probably out there in TV land want to hear us from our sponsors. Okay. And uh, uh, we'll be right back right sure. after this break. Hey, and we're back. And I have not left this room. Well, I did. I had to go to the bathroom, as John, John Russell knows. Um, but we have with us Ed Nelson. We're going to talk about some more great Warlock games. And he is a professor Sir of... <laughs> computer science at uh, UNH Manchester. I'm adjunct professor. so It's all the same to me. <laughs> so if I was waiting for an interview with you, how long should I have waited in this room before leaving? Like, is there, because you know they say, well, if it's a full professor, you got to wait 15 minutes. Is that true? They say that, but the students generally don't leave. Really? Yeah, I mean they they want they want to get their grades. They want they want to do well that semester. I I was a I was I have a good I had a good GPA in college, yeah. and I think a lot of it's because I I was a bit of a brown noser. We didn't have computer science back then because we really didn't have computers. Right. Yeah. I mean it's I, it's just uh, I could go into a million questions about that, but we want I want to talk about another Warlord game, The Gates of Antares. Well, that's a great game. It's a great game. Oh, then the people should buy it. They should. It's uh, it's by Rick Priestley. It's based off the bolt action rules. It's they've just been tweaked to handle what's D10, D10 instead of D6s, but it's they've been tweaked to handle technology, uh, sci-fi technology. So where does it take place? Don't it tell me beyond the gates of Antares. <laughs> <laughs> it takes place on a number of of worlds uh, uh, across the galaxy. It takes place in a future where mankind is traveling the stars using a technology he has no idea how it works, no way to comprehend it. Periodically, it shuts down for reasons known only to the technology. Uh -huh. um, there's a sense of wonder about the game because you could go anywhere. You could be any one of a number of different factions. There's, there's something new to explore. There's, I just love the sense of wonder that, that's part of it. So it's it's like bolt action. So we're, I'm pulling dice out of a bag. I noticed. Yeah, you're pulling dice out of a bag, just like bolt action. You've got a order uh, die per squad, and, and of course these these galactic empires, these different planets, they don't get along because they're fighting. Yeah, 
Some do, some don't. I mean, some some factions uh, are, have the possibility of helping each other out. Some factions are just inimical to just about everybody. Uh, I'm going to actually look inimical up because I don't know if I 100% I know what that uh, means. It just means they hate everybody. <laughs> That's what I thought. That's what I thought it meant. Yeah, yeah that's the gar. The gar hate everybody. Um, and then there's some some factions that uh, are are kind of neutral. They could kind of go either way, you know. Uh, like the Boromites. The Boromites are. Mobsters. Yeah, I I think of the Boromites as mobsters. I have a scenario set up where the Boromites are mobsters. So. So I in 2020, if we get Space Force, will Space Force make its appearance in Gates of Ataris? God, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, me too. That'd be kind of scary. So it's a skirmish level game. Yes. Does it involve ships or just the? No, just the the ground forces. So we're talking. It's still a infantry heavy game. Uh, we're talking about a future now where you can, using special physics or the physics of the time, you can collapse huge amounts of mass into a tiny amount of space. So, for example, the, the rifles the guys are carrying around, that clip, you know, might be, the, you know, the size of my thumb, but it's got, for game purposes, an, an infinite amount of ammo because they just expand it up to the right size, fire the bolts, expand the next one up, and so on. Is it as big as bolt action as far as, let's say I want to do and get into the game and I'm, I want to plunge in, how many models am I looking at getting? Uh, it depends how many points you want to play. I've played with uh, 10, 15 models on a side. I've had great games I at 300 points levels, and that'll play about an hour. Um, I've played 500 points for a long time. I'm getting up into 750 points. We've got a league in New Hampshire uh, where we're getting ready to do our end of league battle. Everybody's bringing 1,275 points. How many factions does that game have? The Gates has five factions or six? Well, we have, we have Boromites, Isaurians, Concord. We're all counting on our hands as, as we this have is going on. We have the Algorins. Then we have the Gar split into three factions now as of the last. Uh, there's the Rebels, the Outcasts, and then the Gar. Right. Then there's the Freeborn. The Freeborn. Um, and then we have the VRI. Right. Yep. This came out, and they're an AI intelligence. I think you're way past five. Yeah, so so I think it's about uh, w with the uh, drone scourge model that just came out uh, in July. They introduced the rebel out the, the Gar outcast, not the rebels, and then the VRI. So we're we're over seven or eight. Yeah. So you know, one of the things with a history-based game, it comes with kind of a built-in fandom. Right. As as you saw us. You know, John and, and Steve here. With sci fi games, you got to kind of niche in gamers. So if I game X, will I like Gates of Antares? And can't say bolt action. Right. Uh, I'm looking for more fantasy, science. Uh, and so I know if I play game X, I'm going to like Gates of Antares. Is that, that that's the question? Yeah. I would say if you play, um, gosh, uh, if you've looked at Counter Blast, for example, by. Patrick Keith, uh, if um, actually Gaslands, uh, you might like it. Uh, that game's blowing up. And <laughs> well, well it, even the Gorilla in the Room, that other company that we don't talk about so much that's yeah. been around for over 30 years and has a huge sci-fi game, I know several of those guys that they're getting tired of having to get the – getting the new rule books or getting the thing, waiting for the next facts to come out. Yeah. But they, when, once they played Gates and they see the simplicity of the dice pool instead of the Yugo I go, I know guys who play that game that are now using the, schema the schematic or the semantics or the, the, the building blocks of how Gates of Atari does that dice pool for their game. And you mean the it. game that like a couple hundred people are playing two floors above us? Yes, exactly. Uh, Which you hear a lot of, you know, good, bad, but it still draws people. Yeah. Is is Gates drawing a lot of folks, or it's starting to. It, in in New Hampshire? We've got a an excellent crowd. We've got uh, the league we're running now. Just at this one hobby store, we got twenty people playing. So yeah, it's it's taken off. The thing everybody seems to like about the dice pull is that 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 sense of anticipation, that drama. Yeah. You know, it's like, am I going to be able to get this guy to the objective, or am I going to be able to? get the dice draw so that I can 
you know, get that shot in. Turan and I were, Buckley and I were talking about that, and I, you look, uh, that mechanic to me is, I have a plan when I go in, and I'm going to wait and react, see what my enemy does, and I'm going to stick with my plan. But with those dice pool games, I need to have an ABC. I need to have different, like, okay, let's say I don't get that first shot. Let's say he moves this. Like, I really have to start thinking on my feet. And it's almost like my exhaustion today is this is a thinking game, and Gates is like that. But it sounds like it's kind of bloody and messy with all of the futuristic-type combat. Um. I, I, it is a thinking game. I, you know, there's no doubt about that. Um, I, the way I think about it is like I, I don't necessarily have a plan, but when I go in, it's like I know how I want to use my troops. I'm going to use this this squad to to help that squad stay alive, or I'm going to use this squad to put some pins on my enemy so that I can charge with this other squad. So I have a sense of how they can work together to get the most out of what needs to be done. I had a game uh, a couple weeks ago where we had to blow up the reactor. It's in the Drone Scourge book. Um, I had only one unit on the board that, would, that was able to blow up the reactor because the only unit I had that had grenades. Mm -hmm. But I protected that squad. I protected that squad. I protected that squad. Turn four, they run up. They're at the objective. They drop off the grenades. Next dice pull, they're all wiped out. End of the turn, I blow up the, the reactor. The reactor I win the game. That's that's I achieved my objective. Yeah, um, and to me, that's like really exciting and really cinematic. The way you explained it is actually kind of exciting too, because I'm trying to think of a game where I had that kind of tense excitement, and I got to be honest, I, it was earlier today with the game I was playing with uh, Turan. It's yeah. th these impulse type games, and I guess it's a better way of pulling, you know, the. The yeah. dice pull, yeah. it has that, and I think that is like a bit of excitement that games need. Oh yeah, in, in order to pull people in, and you know the folks listening out there, it's take look at Gates, look at some of these other games to see if it scratches that itch. You know, we were talking earlier about there's no such thing as a perfect game, right? But that excitement you don't see too much in a lot of games because I guarantee, go upstairs and look at like. Armada, there was a lot of guys playing. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going for it. I don't have to make a lot of decisions. And what you're saying is with Gates, I really have to start thinking on my feet. I have to think. And what's, what's, what I find interesting, at least as far as when I play, you know, everybody has a different experience when they yeah. play. But when I play, it's like there's that animal hindbrain that wants me to do, you know, something you know, that emotional part. But then there's this rational part, and they fight it out during the game. And if I can if I can hang in there, like in this game, it's yeah. like, do, do I try to get this scoring unit there on turn three? And I'm like, no, 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 I really need another five-inch move to be really sure I can get them there. You know, so there was that struggle inside of me while I'm struggling with my opponent. Um, now, do the factions play differently? Yes, they do. A and is it a drastic difference it's subtle difference i started out playing concord yeah and the concord have um are very shooty and the thing i like about the concord is they've got drones so uh they have drones helping them with your accuracy on fire you know if you have a buddy drone you get to reroll one of your misses um they also and they have what was that john you can if you're you can link a drone to a drone. So, for example, if you have an indirect firing right. item, yeah. and, and he can go 20 inches, he can link into another drone to see around the corner. So you can you have a spotter that can look around the corner and lob your grenade into him. But other, those are shooty guys. Those are shooty guys. Um, and then I started painting up the Algren because I decided I really loved the Algren uh, little book. So uh, when I started playing the Algren, I kept getting my butt kicked because I was playing them as a shooty army. And they, what do they specialize in? Well, the way the Algren uh, work is that um, one of the things I didn't realize, the Algren have the ability to have two heavy weapons in the squad, and I wasn't doing that. And once I did that, the heavy weapon they have is, can be used either as an overhead mode, so they can either be used as mortars, or they can be used in direct fire mode. 
And once I did that, all of a sudden I gained enough flexibility in my, s in my regular squads that I would be able to be much more effective because now I can engage my enemy with my mortars or I can engage them direct fire, whatever the situation allows. And then with Concord, I didn't like going in to hand-to-hand -hand combat. I, I shot my enemy apart. With Algren, when I went in with my um, uh, the ladies, the uh, oh. the infiltrators, infiltrators. Sorry, I didn't mean ladies. The warrior women, because they really are kick-ass. But when I when I got them That's on the battlefield, they, yeah. they wow, just they wow. Have two drones, they get crazy. yeah, they did two. So it drones. seems like Gates is very diverse. It's a huge yes, it and is. and you said it's it's a it's a huge type of universe. I, like I said, I love the sense of wonder. So, like, when I go to demo a game, I try to lay out a table that conveys a sense of wonder. I want the player to walk up to that table and say, this looks interesting. There's a story here on the I've table even before we play. Before. Yeah, exactly. Is there a story behind it? What was the, 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 you know, the blank slate that this game came from? Was it just, hey, the let's write something? Recently. Huh? Eric Priestley. Well, <laughs> and we could be here for a long time yeah. talking about that. What it was is they wanted to do something. Uh, basically, these gates open and shut around the the uh, the, the planet Antares. Okay. The star Antares. They're star Antares, yeah. And and, and sometimes they close for uh, hundreds of years, and something happens. And, and uh, uh, sometimes it, it and the uh, civilizations are lost or found, and and it it becomes a like Ed said. Some of the technology they don't know how it works. They just it just goes. Yeah. It, it just works. No idea. And, and they try to find the builder's technology, how, how this stuff happened, how they do these things. And, and once they find a, a possibility, the Concord and the Algern will go in and try to figure out how it is and incorporate it into their system. Whereas the, the Gar will go and say, oh, there's a power source. And they'll go in there and start tearing apart shit and blow stuff up. So are these human factions? Are they aliens or a little mixture of both? Well, let, let me tell you this. This is, this, is, this is another thing I like about Gates of Antares. Um, the Concord are most like what we know of humans as today. The Algorin have been separated long enough. They're starting to drift into their own species. Okay. The Gar are their own species. They but were, They were designed... The, 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 the theory is they were designed to... I don't know, protect the builders or, or protect somebody from something. Sounds to so me like the Gar or brute force. Brute force completely. And, 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 and their, their weapons are blunt, and they, they'll shit plasma and, and stuff. Yeah. Are they they're shooty they're or stabby? I love using gaming both. terms. They're both. They're, both. And they're, they're in a crab-like armored thing. They're, they're weak little pink things that they fall out of. The but awesome battle suits that they ride in. And I'm going to have to go check this out. Th their technology <laughs> is so uh, strange that it, it can distort space-time. Yeah. So and and they, the, the thing that, that Ed has kind of alluded to and talked about, in the future, there's nanites everywhere. Oh, I, yeah, I found a nanite so, in so my bed the other yeah, day, oh, and yeah, I was yeah, like, we done. need to yeah, clean yeah, all yeah, the sheets. Right, yeah. Burn them, just burn them. Yeah. No, but, but they share information. And, uh, you know, we're all familiar with Matrix, and in the Matrix movie, and, and Ed was talking about the Concords, or about the blue pill, red pill thing. Yeah. Well, in, in the in the Concord, or C3, the combined Concord continuum, the right. C3, uh, they they live and breathe by the Intel, the I intelligence that, that tells you. The integrated machine intelligence, the Intel. Yeah, they'll tell you. Oh, it's time. The Intel is never wrong, by yeah. the way. Never wrong. Uh, the Intel will tell you what time Does you get up. Does it open the pod bay doors yeah. when I ask? Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, the Intel will tell you what time you get up. Okay. The Intel will tell you what to eat. The Intel will tell you when to go to school. The Intel will tell you, and then we. But we, if you join the Concord military force, they remove some of that connection. So it's like taking. I bet you wish you took the blue pill, kind of thing. And they realize, holy shit, this is other things going on. So there's a whole sociological backstory with these folks. Oh, oh, oh you should yeah. see John's face. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, the Algren are always next to the Gar. So now they've gotten not only. Trying to figure out what they're all in. Very about. militaristic. Very militaristic. And the guard don't have a nanite society. So, do you think Rick Priestley looked at gamer trends and, and how people play and developed these factions that suit, mimic. that mimic, yeah. like well, brute force so. shooting? Oh, yeah, yeah, probably. Because that's ingenious. Yeah. Well, and then, uh, but then the guard 
we're always. I, always you play the Gar, I have a feeling. Well, no, I, I play Algorin and, and, and Isaurians, and we'll talk about the Isaurians in a second. Oh, I want to talk about the Isaurians. Yes. Uh, or do you want me to talk about the Isaurians <laughs> now? Go, go, go. Okay, so there's the nanites, right? Yeah. So they're called the nanosphere, right? It, it's kind of like our World Wide Web, only nanites, little tiny particles, little tiny robots floating all around. So at one point, some of the humans encountered an alien race. And the technology mixed just enough with the alien race that the nanospore or nanosphere of that group mutated, mutated couldn't come back into the Concord. I am getting angry at you, and I'm pointing and, at and John. And so, and so you know why. I know why. They became the their own faction. How much is the starter box? We have two starter boxes. Oh, good God. This. We have the, the $112. 112 has the hardcover rule book in it. And, and the GAR and the Concord. Gar and Con uh, versus the Concord. Yeah, and then we have a $50 starter that has a, a softback A5 that's got uh, plastic Concord and Algren. Algren, yep. They did, two, they did two approaches. But uh, like uh, Ed was saying, the Isaurians got mutated just enough that they wouldn't fit back into the Concord society. <laughs> so they've become their own cell. They become their own faction. And actually, the reason why I'm talking about this is I'm, I'm psyching myself up bec for another army. Yep. Because I like the idea that if you look at the models, right, the humans, they still have the head and the two legs, but why do their helmets have eight eyes on them? Well, if you look at the alien models, the alien models have eight eyes on them. Oh. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Isaurians have been mutated by the San just enough. That they had this big, huge battle. They beat the San. They left. The, the San took off and disappeared. But then... The Isaurians found some hatching cells from some of the old sons, so now they've taken them. Yep. How long has this game been out to have such a l huge Three backstory? Three years. Three years. R three years? Yeah. And, like, you're, rec you're quoting the history of yeah. these guys. Yeah. Well, this is, w this is another thing that's cool about the game. I mean, as a gamer, it's not, just, it's not just, you know, what the thing does on the battlefield. It's also the, f the fluff, right? So if the fluff is cool, you're going to play that faction. And they now have three short story books out they're starting to get get, get some fluff stories back then we have three we released three i cannot tell you how important that is for oh non yeah. for non historical games so i went home and i got the the uh, strontium Str dogs. dogs comic yesterday yeah. and because i want to read about it because this is this stuff's interesting and i noticed like you guys are selling the the um the case files, the case files and you know, folks like that. Well, history has that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a short story that, that Ed was alluding to about how the Gar can change the time stream continuum. And there's this planet that the Concord go there saying, we've had these reports that something's going on. And they start going down and they start, this one girl is saying, there's something wrong with this place. We need to go check these things out. But they start seeing ghosts and all these kind of things. But actually what has happened is because the Gar just don't give a shit. About anything. They give they're, no shit. Th they're basically polluting the space time, yeah. Yeah, that it warped space and time in these areas, and people were coming back or going around, and these ghosts were former Gar or former Conqueror stuff, or people were walking into holes, and it was just, they ended up just abandoning the planet. Cause it, no, we, we can't clean this up yet. We got to go. This sounds interesting, and I'm getting upset with you because <laughs> I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to come back tomorrow. Well, 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 well what's great is, you can just buy the rule book itself separately, and and the rule book is you're done. The rule book, I yeah, the rule book, and you're done. It has uh, the army lists in them. It has all the rules in them, um, but also the the rule the 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 army lists are also PDFs yeah. online. Yeah, and and, and and they and they've been updating them. And when they update them, you'll get an email. Hey, the Garage list has been updated. Download for free. Uh, what I like, too, and you're going to like this, I think, and I'm sorry, I apologize. You're going to call me Nick again? No, no, <laughs> but what? But Nick, listen. Don't call him Nick. Yeah. yeah. Um, I right. like a rule book that covers things and, and, and does a good job. Yeah. And, and in the Gates of Antares rule book, there's about three pages, and this is a large rule book. It, it's, it's like... It's a couple hundred pages. Yeah, well, and, and it's a legal size rule book. It's not a uh, eight by eleven. It's it's a little bigger. It seems a little bigger. Um, maybe a little bit bigger. Yeah, but there's three full pages of nothing but terrain descriptions and how they affect the game. Wow. Scrub, 
uh, bush. Uh, Carnivorous plants. Uh, <laughs> Carnivorous plants. <laughs> oh, God, yes. And that's what's kind of funny, too. If you Feed me, Seymour. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's yes, like, exactly. Yeah. There's two funny things when you flip through the room book, or, or cool things, or hooks. Uh, one is Hans Noby. Yes. Hans pops up every once in a while. Oh, he's helping you through the rules all the way through. I, I thought it was a real hoot. Yeah. Hey, young buck, what do you think you're doing with that gun? You better put it down before you shoot somebody. Let me show you how to use that weapon. And then all the pictures. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll admit now. The guys went down to the local aquarium store and bought all the kind of plastic shit they could get, and they put it in the background. But it's foreign looking. Yeah. But now it looks like a foreign planet. Yeah. 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 Do you guys have the rule book here today? Of course. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, uh, you might have to ask you to open up the store before I leave. <laughs> uh, I'll pay cash. Um, how do we get people into this game? Um, I've been running demos. I ran, uh, I forget the name of the con. Uh, apologies to the people in Rhode uh, Island. Uh, uh, Con? No, it was, uh, it was, pri- Captain, no, not Captain Con, it I think it was Captain Con. Captain Con. Yeah, it was Captain Con in February. I ran, uh, a lot of demos. Everybody that played it was like, oh my God, this is just wonderful. There's so many layers of this onion when you start, you know, you, you, okay, we all are shooting, what's your defense? But depending upon what faction you play, mm-hmm. depends upon what kind of armor they have. C3 have phase, uh, C3s have, is it phase armor or is no, it? No, it's uh, hyperlated. Hi- hyperlated armor. Isaurians have phase armor, which, mea- which means they may or may not be there where you're shooting. It's kind of like that other army that has pointy hats and their hairdressers that, that, that people are playing nearby here. Yeah. Th- they, they, they time shift. The Isaurians can time shift. Yeah, they can time shift. The Isaurians have a, a weapon that allows them like shoot at a wall and phase shift the wall away so that you can go through the wall. So right now, you guys counted out the factions. What's the future of this game? What's Warlord? Is Warlord going to – is it wait and see? Cause well, there's been a lot of releases this year. Yeah, a lot I'm of releases this year, and then uh, th- they've hinted at – Hinted. And they've shown last year at, at Open Day in the U.K., they had some pictures of the guy working on – on some of the new models, there, there's there's a there's a race that universally is hated by everybody. The Voral. You s- you say it with like such a yeah. guttural yeah. And, the Voral. Everybody hates those guys, and the models that I've seen uh, are alien. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, not not the movie Alien, but they're something that hasn't been done, and they're nasty looking. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. I haven't seen any of that but yet. But if you if you look at on the – they have this big, huge map. Yeah. Rick loves maps and stuff. And there's a map in the book that shows the known space. And the whole bottom of that says the Voral Expanse. Oh, yeah. I do Those remember guys. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so what do we, three guys sitting here in Crystal City, do to get folks excited about this game? Because we can't have Ed at every no. con, every store – to do the demos, like how can we get folks out there like, I mean, what do you recommend for somebody that is listening to this? And even if they don't want to play the game, I want to get the book just so I understand what you guys have been talking about for the last half hour. That was the whole idea behind uh, Cara 9. Cara 9, which is a $50 set. So it's 50 bucks. It 50 bucks. That's it. You Two say squads it, each side, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you get the Algorand and, and the free book. Yeah. No, Algorand and Concord. Concord. Yeah. But – Two squads, it's enough to get your feet wet. You see how the, the dice play out. Uh-huh. Um, like a get started little thing in there. A get started little thing in there. With a reversible poster on the back side. <laughs> nice. You go. Yeah. Cheryl Teague's poster. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Just, it just play it. And it's like, I know that if you haven't seen the game played before, you're not going to get it perfect the first time. Just That's okay. That's okay. So I if mean, I'm a bolt action player, which I guess I could, as of today, I can say, yeah. will I pick the game up very f- quickly? You will see. You'll you will have a lot of the uh, same concepts, like pulling the dice. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll be using d tens instead of d sixes. That might seem a little strange at first, but I'm it all a huge works. fan of bigger dice, by the way. Well, but for for and other and reasons. And what's also cool is is they've expanded. Not only it's a d ten instead of a, a uh, but also some of the um, uh, units in Gates of Antares ha- we call them mods, uh, multiple order dice. So they don't just get one dice in the bag. They get two or even three. They get two or even three. Like the uh, the way the tanks uh, uh, are handled in bolt action, the way they're handled in Gates of Antares is they'll have multiple dice. Um, I have a very lovely Algorand Liberator tank 
it's a it's a mod too and i one of the things i love about it is i get to shoot its twice. weapons twice a turn yeah much to the dismay of my opponents so this is a a deep game that has a good backstory that oh. has factions that fit in with playing with you know our playing styles that um has mechanics that are similar to other popular games bolt action you know other types of impulse what do you guys actually call games like that dice pool games yeah uh dice pool or, or initiative yeah and, yeah. and, and what's r another little wrinkle of gates of Antares that that is hilarious is you've played bolt action now you know how that dice pool goes yes there's a weapon that the concord have yeah this you, you go ahead i think it's called the subverter matrix <laughs> what it does is if and it doesn't work on the on the on the guard because they don't have the, the nanite technology but on any race that has the nanite technology the subverter con uh, will go in it's a drone and if it gets near one of your enemy's units and it activates and successful it steals order dice out of the bag and holds them so i've stolen your ability to start moving your troops because i've infiltrated your it, it's and we all know from yesterday you're like pulling the chicanery card yeah yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's like cyber warfare today, yeah. right? It's 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 tactical on the battlefield cyber warfare. I am messing with your nanosphere. Yeah, so I, I mean, how cool is that? That is kind of neat. Yeah. And you know what's good about fantasy games, especially one that is created in house with you guys, is you can go anywhere you want with it. You you don't have to. There's no research as you guys did for Korea. It's hey, this sounds neat, and you can throw it in the game as an interesting mechanic. Well, and you're, and you're a gamer. And this is the thing that really appealed to me on that we have three modules out now for. There's been three modules. The last ones came out with drone screws. But what's really cool is each module introduces new factions of uh, uh, or, or new units for your... For your new units mm -hmm. and uh, new army lists. Uh, and new personnel, uh, personalities. New personalities, and yeah. And at the end of the book, which is something I'd never seen before in a lot of the games that we play for, for miniatures or even role-playing games, at the end, there's a campaign in these books th that you fight. And at the end of the campaign, depending upon how well your faction did or not did, there's a chart at the end of each of the, of the books that say, if you did uh, two to five points, you had a, a, a low victory. And this is what's going to happen in the next future for the Isaurians. Huh. If you did four or five. So it's a dynamic, almost like a free world dynamic campaign. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool, and uh, I know that like with the Crisis Shard book, oh, yeah. the there's there's this other thing happening on this planet, and it's and it, you know you're playing against your opponent, but this thing called the Crisis Shard is also getting victory points as you play, so it might win the campaign. <coughs> okay, I'm getting the book, <laughs> and I'm going to talk. You know what I'm going to do? I'm I'm going to do something smart. I'm going to talk one of my NDNG brethren. To, I'm going to say have them contact you guys to get involved in this game, because it it sounds really neat, and I'm, I hate you once again. Yeah. Well, Tim, well, Tim, Tim, Tim Bancroft did a great job. He's really doing a great job uh, taking care of it, and and what's really cool is last November they kicked off the Nexus, and if you want to know what games the Gates of Antares is, uh, www.gatesofantares.com. And it'll click you into the Nexus. And they spent a long time developing this. And it's its own cyber world. And it, you click on buttons. Hey, I want to play Isaurians. What should I collect? Boom, boom, boom. This way you should collect. How do I paint them? Well, you can paint them this way, this way. How do I use the, 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 the Isaurian phase sniper? Well, here's some ideas. So there's tons and tons. And they've taken all the articles and some soft stories and some things that they've thought about. And they put it into the Nexus. And it, if you can go to the Warlord website and click on it. So it's like an army builder that gives you all the back information, even how to paint the bottles. Yeah. And, and the, the other thing that, that's in there is there are some articles that explain some of the trickier parts of the rules. Like the subverter matrix. Like how the subverter matrix works, how um, close combat works. I, I, I remember when they told me the Nexus went live, I was driving somewhere to some con or something. And they said, hey, the Nexus is live. And I took out my phone. And I clicked into it, and an hour and a half later, I said, oh, shit, I just lost an hour and a half of my – I was just – I got so deep into it just when it just went live. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to – damn you. <laughs> damn you, man. I mean, like, come on. Well, like, and, and I just want to say this. I mean, I was talking to somebody earlier today. He was a historical gamer, and he said, you know, I want to try it out, but, you know, the 
the names are funny and some of the terms are funny and I get that all right but I come from a background of I've always been a strong science fiction guy so mm -hmm. for me having the openness of the imagination I can go anywhere I could visit any world yeah, it's pretty neat it can be any environment like there's rules for fighting in high radiation environments yeah. low gravity environments for me this is like candy so wow I always said it, it's, it's a hard science Instead of a fantasy, I say it's more like Star Trek than Star Wars. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more m like Star Trek. It's, yeah. it's you know, y it, it, there's there's definitely scientific considerations in, in, into it. You know, it's, it's more and that Star Trek-y, there are rules, there, there's, there's things going on here, and it, it just feels more science-y based. And so let's say I don't have a degree in physics. Yeah. I will still get this game. It's explained easy enough. Oh, yeah. It's worth... When I got the rule book, it was the first rule book in a long time that I got lost in, if that makes any sense. No, it totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I, I could spend hours, and it's still, I crack it open sometimes just to page through it. So would you say this is, is this a niche game for a specific faction of gamers, or is this something that anybody that games anywhere in this building today will find something about it they like? Because I think it's more the latter. I think it'll be you will find it, something in there that you will like. Uh, one of the reasons, another reason I like Gates of Antares, it's not, it's not like a one trick pony. Oh, I, if I have a very shooty army, I always win. It's not like that. It's very, it rewards thinking. It rewards uh, knowing how to use your units to combine to achieve your effect. Yeah. And for me, that gives it a lot of depth on the, on the table that I really appreciate. All right. Well, damn it, Sam. Okay. Well, uh, I got I show you. Oh, he's going he's to pull something out. See, this is what I hate about talking to you guys, as I love talking to you guys. We could talk for hours. Yeah. However, I end up uh, getting a lot of stuff. But, I mean, you know, let's be honest. You know, these hobbies, that's, that's what they're about. So what I love, and I'm going to ask this, is sure. as you go to cons, tell us, and we will put on our website where you will be to spread some of this. Oh, wow, look at that. Who signed this Gates of Antares book? This is a nice book. To John Russell for a signed copy with help. Thanks for all your help. You're a very attractive man. Rick Priestley. That's really, yeah. Wow. And look, it's a tab book. And I'm like looking through the book now. And the Gar Gouger gun. Oh, this is pretty neat stuff. You see, there's pictures of all the weapons. There's pictures of all the weapons. <coughs> what faction is that? Oh, those That's are the Freeborn. <coughs> Freeborn. They, the Freeborn are are they weren't born in a, in a in the nanite circles. They have their own kind of. They're the traders, so they have the best of everything. Oh, and then here we have the drones. Right. Yeah. That's an see, that, there's an Asorian. See the difference? Yeah. Wow. It, it, it's a bio, more of a biological. Yeah, the technology mixed with the biological. So if I'm like a real tech geeky kind of guy and I want to learn a little science or a little thinking, mm -hmm. this is, yeah. And how much does this hardcover book cost? 48 huh? 48 dollars. $48. Yeah, you have one? You have one? Is it signed by Rick Priestley? No, but I can't get it for you. Huh? I'll, get it for you. I'll tell you what. I, I would like Ed to sign mine. Okay. okay. Awesome. And um, I'll tell you what. I will, uh, I would love to get some of our listeners and readers to throw. Oh, my God, there's a huge map. Yes. Wow. And that's the Voral domination. And then the Vorals are the folks that nobody likes. That nobody likes, yep. Here's, here's the Gar. Yeah. And, that, and the Algern are stuck against them, so the Algern have been fighting them for, like, and there's the Isorians Ice and there's the Gonfors. <laughs> you know, one of the things I love about books that you guys put out is they're, they're very eye, they're a lot of eye candy. And I think you and I had a, a talk about that when we first talked is, you know what I hate about Warlord is I pass by and I never, you know, I didn't play the game two years ago. I'm always looking at your boxes because it, they just pop out and I hate that. And it's like, it's there's, sex appeal. There's the Gar. Okay, the Gar look like robots. There's Hans. That's Hans? Yeah, he, pop, he has these little vignettes. It every looks like Tiny Lister. Hey, let me tell you how to use that weapon. Now, this is a thick rule book. Um, how long is it going to take somebody that's a slow reader 
is not that intelligent like myself to get through something like that to learn how to play the game. Well, you said something about quick start rules. Yeah. Not quick reference sheet. There's a quick reference sheet, and you're not going to read it cover to cover. What no. you're going to do is you're going to read through 40, some of the yeah, 40, 50 pages. 40, 50 pages of basic rules and uh, fluff. And then you're going to play some games with that, and then uh, you're going to start um, adding in additional layers of rules. Narrative scenarios. Oh, yeah. The narrative scenarios hooked me right away because, um, you know, it's the narrative scenarios are about telling the story. Yeah. Have other scenarios that are more about just, you know. Yeah. This is. Yeah. Okay. Um, wrap one up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's you guys need to put out crappy games. Yeah, and the, those look like flowers somebody took from uh, somebody's uh, potting. And I wish I could show people out there, obviously. We're talking, radio, it's dead. Um, but it, the book, aesthetically, it's very pleasing. And there's a lot of stuff here. And, you know, you talk about nobody reads bo rule books cover to cover. I do. I do. And, you know, getting ready for this event, I picked up the book right after you and I spoke. It was about a year, 14 months ago. Yeah. I read that book. Yeah. If I said I'm not going to play it until, you know, at first I paint my army and get everything ready, I'm going to read that rule book. And I I find reading rule books fun. To me, it's... I, that's what makes Strontium Dog so fun. That's what makes Strontium Dog so fun because it's like another, it's like give me an interesting rule book. If I don't want to read the fluff, and I notice in, in, in history books, I don't read the fluff. And I've written fluff for history games. I don't even read that because it's, you know, I guess I am I feel I know everything about history. But stuff like this I think is interesting. And Strontium Dogs, I want to know the backstory, you know. Johnny and Durham. I, I want to know, so I picked up the books. And this looks like it has it all in one thing. As I was telling you about the train. Yeah. The train, okay. There's that. Yeah, look at that. Ruins, marsh, rocky, pinnacles, yeah. junkyard, deep, deep water, lava flows. Hot water geysers, junkyard. Hot water geysers, yeah. goes in the opposite direction. Where are the, uh, the, uh, the uh, carnivorous? Plants? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Spiker scrubs? Spiker scrub. yeah. One of these. So the terrain can kill me is just as much as anything else. Oh, yeah. More, more fauna. All right, so folks out there, I am, I'm going to pick up the, a copy of this book. And I'm going to sneak out of here before uh, I'm just going to hand John my wallet. <laughs> and uh, I need to get a Warlord account. Let's pretend I have a store. Okay. And uh, I'm also going to post for you guys um, where Ed's going to be for the next couple of months. And don't get worried. Yes, yeah, some of us do work for the government, but we're not we're not we're not like that. But yeah, there's Can a few I things tell you about the, the next convention that I'm going to go to. I would love for it. Hopefully it will. This will be out next week. It, it's going to be in uh, Vermont. It's going to be uh, Carnage Con. I'm running some uh, demos up there for Gates of Antares. OK. And well, we have a Canadian contingent that are hardcore gamers. Black Powder, by the way. Huge. Huge. And we'll see if we can get them down there. But I would like to get stuff on so people can see. I'm going to go and download some pictures. Yeah. And so people can see like. How pretty this game is. Go to the Nexus. Yeah, go to the Nexus. You'll get all the I'm going to be a, on the Nexus as I'm driving home. <laughs> the Nexus of the universe. Yes. But, you know, and I guess, yeah, I'm already getting like, hey, where are you? But uh, there's a few things that I don't want to say, guys. First of all, thank you very much. Right. This was awesome. Um, I thought the experience here today and, like, talking to these guys, and some of them I've been emailing back and forth before, I found that, like, the game community extremely welcoming. You hesitate almost to say brotherhood. No, I, I'll say brotherhood. Yeah. Because there was no women here. No, well, <laughs> but it, it, it gaming is a fraternity. Yeah, and, and, and it does. It, it, there, I know I can call Ed and ask some questions about Gates. I know I can call guys. We, we've got guys all across the United States now. We can say, hey, I'm coming yeah. by. You want to play something? Or it, it, it's it's uh, it's kind of nice. Yeah, and, and one thing that you guys can't see, and it's with Ed, it's with John, it's with Steve, is the passion that these guys have for these games. And when you sit down, like, John can sell, what they say, a, a, ketchup, a ketchup popsicle to a woman with white gloves. He can, but it's, and even listening to Ed now, too, talk about Gates of Antares, it's this passion. And I think as gamers, we're all searching for that. We know we'll never find the perfect game, but, like, can I find a quick fix? Can I find what is interesting? Yeah. 
And even if, like, you get the rule book and you never play the game, which a lot of, I do. I am a rule book collector. I have black powder. I have al- almost all the supplements. I've sat down and played the game once, and it's because my stuff's based differently. Right. But it, it's one of those things where, you know, you appreciate the, the passion behind these games. And I thought, like, here at a con, and the big thing I would say from my whole experience in painting my army and getting ready is folks out there should not be scared to come to a con as a new player. I played a guy, too. It was his second game, yeah, and we had a great time. And, and, and nobody stomped your ass. Everybody said, hey, go, uh, Mitch, try this and this instead. Well, this the this. last guy I played said, my army, who built your list? It sucks. Uh-huh. It was a joke because it's Turan, and he, he oh, built my list. list. So <laughs> he, bu- joke, he built my list. He goes, yeah, if I would have known you had this. And, like, I, I really kind of enjoyed that because I've seen other games where guys are tearing each other's heads off. Yeah. New meat? Yeah, and it's, exactly. like, new meat, and a lot of it is, which is, like, another thing that you have is, like, you go upstairs to these games that have world championships or North American championships. I don't think that brings what is best about our community out. Well, one of the things I've observed locally is that it's like, you know, I'll, I'll be playing somebody in a competitive situation. I'm like, you didn't do the rule quite right. Yeah. Oh, you mean I did too much? No. This is, if you do it right, you get more. And it's like, you don't get that in games. Right. And, and uh, for the you guys, in Mis- yeah, in the, you guys in the Missouri area or the Arkansas area, Check out a guy named Brian Swanson. Brian Swanson is doing a lot of stuff like Ed's doing in that area. And we got some uh, cons that he's going to be at uh, coming up. Uh, Spa Con in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and Claw Con in St. Roberts. And Recruits. Recruits is a big one. And Recruits is a hotbed of Gates of Antares players. And that's going to be at the end of the uh, of September at a, um, a Lee Summit in Kansas. Well, we have on our site, we just put in a uh, events calendar. I will send you guys a, f- just fill it out, and I'll upload it to the calendar sure. where you guys are going to be, where some of these great games are played. And a lot of it is, like, I know you, a lot of you guys buy the models because the boxes look cool, the games look interesting, but the real excitement and beauty of some of these games is in the interactive environment. Uh, yeah, I understand the hesitancy of guys going to cons, but for the most part, it's a lot of like-minded people. You know, I like to say it's uh, usually college-educated white guys with a lot of disposable income. Yeah, okay, it is. Um, That's our demographic. But it's like-minded people that have a passion for games. And and that's something from talking to you guys is is that passion that's there. Like, you know, yeah, I I curse John out for selling me stuff all the time. But I, I see his passion, and I trust his passion. And I think for some of you folks out there, it's like, you know, listening to these guys. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm excited about Korea. Yeah. Oh, I am too. Having uh, listened to Steve and John talk about it, I mean, I've been interested in Korea already. I, r- I did uh, a brief overview of Korean, but after hearing you guys talk about it, I'm even more excited. Well, and the other thing is, guys, we all like to share our passion. We all will help you build your armies and we'll help you paint. A guy that I love to watch paint and and does some phenomenal stuff for us, James Wapple and Wappalicious. If, if his Wappalicious website and his and his wife Kathy. They have a, a thing you go watch. He does 90-minute paint sessions because that's how long his battery would last. And yeah. Die. And that dude can paint some crazy stuff, and he's phenomenal. And he, I, 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 he painted my Asaurians, and I love the wow when I put them on. I, I'll gladly say it. I didn't paint these. James Wapple painted them. But and the people are like, holy shit, look at that stuff. Yeah. Oh, I noticed that too t- today, too. Like, a lot of guys had really hot painted stuff. And they'll tell you about And who stuff. painted Strontium Dogs? Oh, those were mine. Those are mine, but thank you. But, uh, they look pretty good. They look all right. Yeah. But it, it, they look really good. Yeah, thank you. That's how I relax, and that's my therapy Yeah. Some for some other things. But James Wapple and Kathy Wapple are crazy stuff. And then Lynn Stahl with, with Metalheads. L- Lynn is doing great stuff. And that's what I like about going to some of these cons is not only do we pick up new players, we pick up new painters, and they get some great ideas. Yeah. Uh, Reaper Con is a huge convention that was the same weekend as, as Nova, and, and that is all based – it's in based in Texas, but they draw a lot of painters. And they have a lot of passion stuff going on down there. Yeah. So, I mean, I had a great time. I want to uh, definitely thank you guys. Once again, it's Gates of Antares will be coming home for me. I want to, And I, uh, I'm going to talk to Ed offline about getting more buzz about Gates of Antares on No Dice, No Glory. Um, I, it looks, from the, the book, it's, it's kind of neat. Yeah, and it's, it's, you're right. It's not an uh, 8.5 by 11. It's, uh, 
I think so that's the English page version, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. It's what do they call it? A fourteen, A four. That's the one. Yeah. And Ed, since you're new, I asked this question. I didn't ask sure. Steve, yeah. but I've asked him. What other games do you play? Uh, okay, so I I backed uh, Drop Fleet Commander. We don't. We, we okay. Um, a, a lot of people out there did. Yeah, I, I played uh, Drop Zone Commander. Um, I've been. I played War Master. I was oh big into War Master. I, I did a uh, a HP Lovecraft Cthulhu themed demon army for War Master. I even sculpted some of my own miniatures and uh, and uh, had somebody buy the the sculpts from me and they're producing them. Um, what so was your What was your first game? My first game. My first game. I'm gonna say is uh, you ready for this? Yeah. Panzer Leader. Oh my Hill. You and I could talk for a long time. Panzer Leader. Panzer Leader. Oh. And then I bought Panzer Blitz, and I bought Arab Israeli Wars, and I had nobody to play, but I loved tanks. Do you know Do you know what I bought last week? What? It was an impulse buy. I bought, somebody was selling a partially punched copy of Arab Israeli Wars. Yeah. Wow. And I have it in the house. And, you know, these guys are making these uh, third market counters. Yeah. So, uh... I'm going to be playing the hell out of that game. That's that's awesome. So we're all Avalon Hill junkies. There's an there's another game that really got me into science fiction, and that it's a game called Grav Armor, produced. Oh, yes, by uh, by uh, uh, Viking Crest. Viking. Uh, I think so. I think Arnold Hendricks was the game developer. Uh, at least I remember his name. You can download it now online. Um, yeah. I'm not sure you can because. It was for a while. It was for a while, but I think he might have pulled it back because he was supposedly, uh, and I hope he does, Arnold, if you're listening, please, uh, developing uh, the rules or updating the rules. The, 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 the game about that was it was Viking Press, Viking Star, Viking, it was like a $5 game. Yeah, yeah, it was a $5 game. And, and, and the train changed depending upon what scenario you were playing. Yeah, it was a hex-based game, and, like, the colors of the, the hexes, like, in this scenario – uh, the blue is is hardened metal, and the red is liquid metal. And this so you got to stay on your toes. Well, y well, yeah. It's like so the game changed, and it's like and there's the, each tank had a number of drones that were helping it out, and it, it, it was just it hit that sweet spot for me. So since we're gonna get the government to follow you, and we went to your house, and we looked at your game collection, what is something that is on your shelf that would surprise the hell out of us? Uh, that would surprise the hell out of you. You will probably be surprised. By the uh, sailing ships, I've I've got hanging around. Really? Yeah. And you uh, play? Do you play sailing ship games? Um, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I I backed Sails of Glory. I played that a couple times. I have that too. I've got some GHQ miniatures. I picked up Bloody Broadsides, um, which is Hunt. Jeff Hunt. Uh, I forget the scale. Is that one nine hundred? So anyway, I Bloody Broadsides. Uh, it, I'm, I'm l Sales of Glory is close. Bloody Broadsides is closer. I'm looking for that, that sweet spot of rules where it's easy to play but captures the feel. Um, Bloody Broadsides is aptly named. It's a lot of fun. It just blowing stuff up. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of great gamers. And just like, you know, we're all gaming junkies. And, you know, I, I, I can recommend a million games. Yeah. The thing is it's, you know, right now people are like, hey, you know, you guys have been droning on, but listen to the excitement of these guys, and we're going to post Ed's schedule. We're going to post where John is going to be, where, where the Raiders are. Uh, we're going to be covering a lot more stuff from Warlords. I'm going to pick up Gates of Antares on my way out of here. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we're going to talk about this, and we would love to have you guys back awesome. uh, as new games pop out. Or if there's something, like, you guys feel is interesting, we'll – Pop online because the computer science, you should know, you know, yep. and uh, we'd love to talk about it. But uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Sean because people are like, oh, you guys have only been talking for two and a half. This will be this is my this will eat up all the bandwidth for our, our September release folks out there. But um, so we're here at the Nova Open and I want to thank the guys from Warlord. Putting on a great con, showing me a good time, getting me to spend a lot of my money. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to Sean. And Sean, take us out. Thanks so much for joining the show tonight. 
Remember to follow us on Twitter at No Dice, No Glory. And keep the conversation going on NoDiceNoGlory.com, now featuring our own message boards. Have a great night, everybody.